act with a disregard for their own safety. In older adults, signs of self-neglect can include failure to take medicine or seek medical treatment, dehydration, poor hygiene, leaving a burning stove unattended, not wearing weather-appropriate clothing, hoarding, and not keeping up with basic housekeeping. They may also be experiencing depression or malnutrition. As with children, self-neglect can result from other types of abuse, so look for those signs as well. You can make a difference in a person's life, and that's very important to me, and I enjoy it. You know, for the most part, it's all good. But I, I enjoy my job, and I, even if there's abuse like that situation, I, you know, I help the mother so that it stopped. And if you can make one difference like that, that's good enough for me. When you help someone in need, you can know you've done the right thing. And as a caregiver, it is your responsibility to report what you see. Working with children and adults, you are mandated by law to report any suspected cases of abuse to the proper agencies. Every state has its own required reporting guidelines and agencies, so it is important to know your state law as well as your organization's policy for abuse reporting. You may also make an anonymous claim, though providing your name allows the protective agency to contact you in case they have any questions. Being available to the caseworker will help them identify if it is in fact a case of abuse. In your organization, there will be specific people to whom you must also report the abuse. For instance, you must first report the incident to your organization's president or to your designated senior administration staff person. An incident report should be completed. A senior staff member will be designated to assist with the report to the appropriate local or state agency. Family members should also be notified if an incident of abuse is suspected. In cases where an employee is accused of abuse, a report must also be made to the organization's insurance agent. Reporting suspected abuse may upset patients and families. They may file complaints of their own or threaten legal action. The investigating protective agency will take the lead role once a report is made. The referral source always stays confidential. We never tell that, even in a court of law, we're not allowed to. And when you're testifying, sometimes these cases get to court, the judge will caution you if you get too close to giving details that will even give it away. I'd rather have the family upset with me and I'm wrong than to miss something. It's, it's very difficult and depending on the patient and how confused they are, it's very difficult to just decipher whether it's true physical abuse or if it isn't because the family doesn't want the patient to, to say anything and the patient doesn't want to offend anybody. So I, I err on reporting. When you report an abuse situation, you will need to provide as much information as you can. That is why it is important to work with the individuals within your organization who are most familiar with abuse reporting policies and procedures. Those individuals will support you through each step of the process, including meeting with the assigned state agency's caseworker. You may be asked about details of the incident and how you became aware of the situation. Once you've made your report, the protective agency will start its investigation based on the emergency level. If the agency cannot determine whether the child or adult is currently safe, they must immediately begin the investigation. They will want to see the alleged victim in person and will begin the thorough investigation lasting approximately 30 days. At the end of their investigation, they will make the decision as to whether abuse has occurred. When we feel that there's a situation where we're at risk, then we go together. I'll make sure that I go with another another staff member, whether that's the chaplain or if that's a nurse aide, I go, we go together and we do that regularly. Your organization adheres to a number of standards to prevent any type of abuse from being committed by its employees. 
One way the organization can protect itself is with rigorous employee screening and background checks. Background checks should be thorough and well documented, including social security numbers and residency verification, reference checks, professional license verification when applicable, review of local and state abuse registries, as well as criminal background checks. Your organization may enforce additional standards as well. To avoid incidences of abuse, an organization can use education and training programs to provide its staff with information on interpersonal skills, managing difficult resident care situations, conflict resolutions, stress reduction techniques, and observing and reporting abuse. Employees should also receive training on establishing and maintaining professional boundaries with their patients and families. Professional boundaries provide a framework for a safe environment for both the patient and the staff member. It is often the staff member's caring and nurturing tendencies and their desire to be helpful that leads to boundary violation. Boundaries are a way of protecting yourself. Another important aspect of any abuse prevention program is ongoing monitoring and supervision of employees and volunteers as they interact with patients and their families. This can be done through direct observation, review of notes, and review of patient family satisfaction surveys. Every employee, not just supervisory staff, has a responsibility to report behavior they feel is not in compliance with the organization's policies and may negatively impact a patient or their family. A healthcare organization should have a zero tolerance policy regarding abuse. And at the same time, it should prohibit retaliation against any employee or volunteer who reports a good faith complaint of abuse or who participates in any related investigation. It's always best to report anything you see at all, even if, you, if you're not sure. You know, you're best to be on the safe side and report it. If you feel something's going on, you know, be that person's advocate. If they're too afraid to speak up, then, you know, be their voice and, and do it for them. None of us are that far from that place where we're going to need other people. So I think all of us try to be the person who can help, if that makes sense. We want to be that person that reaches out to those people. We don't want to scare them away. We want to help them. Um, and it, is, it, it has a definite impact on all of us. And I work with a very good team of people, and we are a team. And when we need each other, sometimes you go back to the office and you've got to cry or you've got to talk it out or you've got to stamp your feet and we're all there for each other because it, it's part of your life, it becomes part of your life and you don't, you don't leave it in the office, you're driving home and you see somebody with gray hair and they're walking, you think, oh no, I wonder if she's okay and it kind of, it, it becomes a part of your life, but it's a good part of your life. It just makes you aware of things a lot of people don't think about. This job will never be about just you. You care deeply about the work you do and the people you care for. You have the ability to recognize the seven types of abuse. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, financial exploitation, neglect, abandonment, and self-neglect. You know the signs of abuse and you can document them. You are required by law to report any abuse you observe and you're protected by the law so that you can take action on behalf of those in your care. You have the power and the responsibility to stop the cycle of abuse.